Well, it's horrific. Uh, these poor people, uh, 400, 400 of them, had fled from the northern uh, Gaza Strip uh, last night uh, seeking refuge uh, because they were no longer safe uh, in their homes. Uh, we had given them uh, refuge in our school, um, and uh, at 11.30 last night, three of them uh, were using the toilet facilities in the school, and they had just uh, come out of the toilets, uh, and they were struck by a, by a missile uh, from, a, from, a, from an aircraft. Um, and killed uh, instantly. Um, so it's, uh, it's just, uh, again, more evidence of how dangerous it is. There's no place in Gaza safe for the ordinary people here, and they're terrorized uh, by the fact that uh, they can be next. Uh, the numbers speak for themselves, 600 dead, almost 3,000 injured. Uh, they're right to be terrorized. I'll come back to that situation in a moment, but in terms of the school itself, the building, I mean, is it marked at all? Is it identified as a school, a UN Absolutely. building? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, we have provided the GPS uh, coordinates of every single one of our locations. Uh, they are clearly marked uh, with UN uh, insignia, flags flying, uh, lights shining on the flags at night, and so on. Uh, it's very clear uh, that these are United Nations installations. Just a final thought on this particular incident. What do you want to happen? I mean, uh, would it, uh, are you calling for an investigation of any sort? Absolutely. We are calling for accountability for all actions in this conflict as per the Geneva Convention. There are laws of war, and everybody who, who is involved in, in war has to be accountable under those laws for every action that they take. Every life is precious, and everybody has to take that responsibility very seriously. So again, those who were involved, uh, uh, there needs to be an, a, an impartial, independent uh, investigation to establish accountability for that and all other actions here on the Palestinian side and on the Israeli side. Now, you were talking about the, the general situation for the civilian population. Let's concentrate on, on that now. Just how grave is the situation? You're there on the ground. Just describe to us uh, what it is like for an ordinary Palestinian living through this. Well, firstly, firstly, they are petrified, terrified, uh, because they know they're not even safe hiding in their own homes. Um, there's a million people without electricity, uh, 750,000 without, uh, without water. Um, everybody is short of food. Uh, the hospitals are overwhelmed. The, the staff, I was in the main hospital this morning as well, heroic staff working around the clock, uh, two Norwegian surgeons there, uh, really at the end of their tether uh, when they see just the scale and the nature of the injuries that are coming in. Uh, it, it's, you know, it's a horrific situation. Um, a, a huge military operation going on in a densely populated area, of course there are going to be very large numbers of casualties and very horrific casualties at that. You'll be aware of uh, the Israeli justification for why they are taking this action, but on the humanitarian side of things, you talked about food there, about power. H how close is the situation to actually there not being enough food now? Because we have seen pictures through the course of this morning of some sort of humanitarian convoys being allowed in with, with supplies being delivered. Uh, there's, we're, we're on the, uh, you know, we're on the cusp of, uh, of a catastrophe here. Um, there was already a shortage of, uh, of basic humanitarian supplies even before this military operation began. Now it's, uh, it's next to impossible to actually get the aid through uh, the, the areas of conflict. Even if we do, and we did have some success yesterday, it was very, very difficult just to get it to our distribution centres. Then people have the, uh, uh, the task of actually getting themselves from their homes to our centres to receive their aid, and it's, as I say, very, very dangerous. Um, you know, the whole thing has to stop. Um, as um, so many of the world leaders have said, there's no solution, uh, there's no military solution to this, uh, to this problem. In fact, this conflict is the result of political failure. That lies on the shoulders of all politicians, and, uh, and it's on their shoulders now to actually uh, stop the fighting and get back to a political... Exactly process. on that point, in terms of the international community, isn't the truth that it will stop when the Israelis decide that they have achieved the military objectives they wanted to achieve, when they decide it is time to stop. And that underlines, doesn't it, the total impotence of the international community. 
Well, if that is if that is if that is the case, then that certainly uh, underlines the impotence of the international community because the international community have responsibility to act, not just to issue statements, but to take action when they see in conflict a civilian population without the legal protections that they are entitled to, when they see so many casualties uh, unfolding day after day after day. But you know, Palestinians, the Palestinian leadership, Hamas, they have their responsibility and should be held accountable under international law for that, equally the Israelis and the international community itself. So the political leaderships everywhere now have to take action. It's very clear to everybody the scale and nature of what's going on here. Uh, we have to cut to the chase and get it stopped. So now let's get action rather than words from all quarters. And let's hold under international law everybody accountable for whether they act or don't act effectively.